can do reactors produce electricity using the heat that comes from splitting uranium atoms in a process called nuclear fission. The fuel is naturally occurring uranium that's processed into small pellets. The pellets are sealed into metal tubes, which are welded together to form a fuel bundle. The fuel bundles are then inserted into a large tank called a calandria, which is the heart of the nuclear reactor. In Kandu reactors, a special kind of water called heavy water flows around the fuel bundles. Heavy water is found in all water, rivers, lakes, and oceans. On average, one out of every 7,000 drops of water is heavy water. It's 10% heavier than ordinary water because it incorporates a heavy form of hydrogen called deuterium. The heavy water slows down tiny particles called neutrons, so they are more likely to hit and split the uranium atoms. A chain reaction of splitting atoms releases tremendous heat into the heavy water. The heated heavy water flows through a closed loop system that's pumped through the reactor to a set of steam generators where it transfers the heat to ordinary water. When that water boils, it turns into steam. The steam is transported at high pressure through pipes to a large turbine where it pushes the blades and turns a shaft connected to a rotor in the generator, causing the rotor to spin. The spinning rotor is a large electromagnet that produces rotating magnetic fields. These fields move across coils of copper wire in the generator, producing electricity. First, let's look at controlling the reactor. When the reactor is operating, the power level is controlled by adjuster rods and by varying the water level in vertical cylinders. Sensitive detectors constantly monitor different aspects like temperature, pressure, and reactor power level. When needed, can-do reactors can safely and automatically shut down within seconds. Nuclear reactors have two independent, fast-acting, and equally effective shutdown systems. The first shutdown system is made up of rods that drop automatically and stop the nuclear reaction if something irregular is detected. The second system injects a liquid, or poison, inside the reactor to immediately stop the nuclear reaction. Both systems work without power or operator intervention. However, they can also be manually activated. These systems are regularly and safely tested. Once a can-do reactor is shut down, it will stay this way until restarted by the operators in the control room. There is absolutely no possibility of the reactor accidentally restarting on its own after it's shut down. The reactor must be manually restarted. Following shutdown, the amount of energy produced by the reactor decreases rapidly. The nuclear fuel will, however, continue to produce some heat and must be cooled. That heat, called decay heat, represents a small fraction of the heat produced during normal operation. Now let's look at the second basic function, cooling the fuel. Because of decay heat, nuclear fuel requires continuous cooling whether or not the reactor is operating. Fuel cooling involves three main systems. The heat transport system, the steam system, and the condenser cooling system. Let's take a closer look at each of these. The heat transport system brings the heat produced by the reactor to the steam generators. This system is made up of very robust pipes filled with heavy water, a rare type of water found in nature. Pipes and other components are maintained and inspected regularly and replaced if needed. Inspections include measuring pipe wear and tear and identifying any microscopic cracks or changes well before they become a problem. The second system, the steam system, uses normal water. The heat from the reactor turns this water into steam to run the turbines and generators. That steam is then cooled and condensed using a third system that pumps in cold water. 
from a body of water such as a lake or reservoir. This is called the condenser cooling system. Like other components, the steam and condenser cooling systems are regularly inspected. A simpler cooling system is used when the reactor is shut down for an extended period, for example during a planned outage. It requires little power to function and is connected directly to the heat transport system. In the unlikely event of a loss of heavy water, which could, for example, be caused by a pipe break, emergency injection systems would ensure water continues to circulate over the fuel to cool it. Emergency injection systems would work with pressurized tanks of nitrogen or pumps. All plants have two or three injection systems. A collection basin located in the basement of the reactor building would recover the water and pump it back into the reactor until repairs are made. Now, let's look at the third basic function containing radiation. Nuclear reactors are built with multiple barriers to safely contain radiation. At the heart of all can-do reactors are hardened ceramic pellets made of natural uranium. These pellets contain the radiation. They form the first layer of containment. The pellets are contained in rods, which form the second layer of containment. Can-do fuel rods are made of zerk alloy, a metal alloy extremely resistant to heat and corrosion. The rods are then loaded into pressure tubes, which are part of the heat transport system. This is the third layer of containment. The pressure tubes are contained inside a metal tank called the calandria, which itself is contained inside a thick vault made of reinforced concrete. The fourth layer of containment is the building that houses and protects the reactor. The walls of the reactor building are made of at least one meter of reinforced concrete. The reactor building is surrounded by a one kilometer exclusion or buffer zone. All plants are equipped with high efficiency filters. These filters are used as part of the operation to minimize radioactive releases from nuclear power plants. These releases occur as part of normal activities like system maintenance. Filtering systems are regularly inspected and power plant operators must, by law, report all radioactive releases into the environment. In the unlikely event of an accident, safety systems are in place to protect the containment from internal pressure due to steam releases inside the reactor building. In a single unit station, internal pressure would be lowered by spraying water from a dousing tank. Candon is unique with its ability to refuel on power. This feature, when combined with Candu's renowned fuel efficiency, provides significant advantages that other types of reactors cannot. Defective fuel, for example, can be detected and removed without shutting down the reactor. The plant can also run for extended periods without the need for a planned outage for fueling. In fact, a Candu plant leads the world record of 894 days of continuous operation resulting in operators minimizing their financial impact associated with fuel-related outages. The on-power fueling process is highly automated and is based on decades of experience accumulated from around the world since 1963, resulting in the fueling process that has proven to be highly reliable and safe. This video presentation provides an overview of the prime feature on-power fueling system while illustrating a typical fueling sequence. The fueling for the ACR-1000 starts with the arrival of new fuel bundles in the new fuel loading areas located next to the containment building. Here, the bundles are removed from their packaging and thoroughly inspected. The field operator tracks each bundle by its unique serial number. Inspected fuel bundles are manually loaded into the new fuel transfer mechanism trough. A motorized loading ram loads pairs of fuel bundles into the new fuel magazine. The magazine is then closed and sealed, allowing the fuel to be transferred through the containment wall to one of the two fueling machines. Fueling operations, starting with the new fuel loading, are automated and controlled from the main control room by a qualified fuel handling operator. 
Inside the containment, a fueling machine is aligned and clamped on to the new fuel port. The fueling machine snout plug is removed and stored. With the containment boundary maintained, the transfer ram pushes up to 16 new fuel bundles, one pair at a time, into the fueling machine magazine. Once the fuel is loaded, the containment isolation valves are closed. The fueling machine snout plug is replaced and the machine is filled with water. The fueling machine then unclamps from the new fuel port. The two fueling machines automatically move to the first selected fuel channel. When the alignment is complete, the machines clamp on to the end fittings of the selected fuel channel. A leak check is performed and the process of opening the channel begins. Each fueling machine removes the snout plug, followed by the closure plug. The upstream fueling machine removes the fuel support plug and inserts two new fuel bundles into the channel flow. The other fueling machine at the downstream end of the channel unlocks the fuel support plug. The fueling machine ram is then retracted and the fuel string follows. This allows the last pair of spent fuel bundles to be separated from the end of the fuel string and stored in the magazine. This spent fuel is continuously cooled with the fueling machine closed loop water system. The magazine rotates and the next pair of spent fuel bundles is removed from the channel. This process continues until the specified number of bundles are removed. When complete, the downstream ram pushes the remaining fuel string and the fuel support plug back into the fuel channel. The upstream fueling machine adds additional pairs of bundles to complete the 12 bundle fuel string. It then reinstalls the fuel support plug in the upstream end fitting. After both fueling machines replace the channel closures and snout plugs, each machine then depressurizes the snout plug cavity and confirms that the channel closure is leak tight. Successful leak checks allow the machines to unclamp and back away from the fuel channel end fittings. The two fueling machines are repositioned to the next pre-selected fuel channel in the refueling sequence. Typically, two channels are refueled during each trip to the reactor, a process that takes three and a half hours to complete. Once the selected channels are refueled, the spent fuel is then transferred to storage. The downstream fueling machine clamps onto the spent fuel port. The snout plug is then removed, opening the fueling machine to the transfer port. The spent fuel port containment valves are then opened, allowing the ram to push the spent fuel bundles, one pair at a time, into the spent fuel port. Water circulated through the discharge tube pushes the spent fuel into the spent fuel transfer mechanism located in the reception bay. The containment valves are then closed. The spent fuel bundles are transferred into stainless steel storage baskets. Each storage basket holds 36 bundles. Once filled, the baskets are moved underwater to the main storage bay. Typically, the spent fuel is stored here for up to six years, after which the fuel is dried and the sealed baskets are transferred to on-site dry storage. On-power fueling has been employed safely and successfully in can-do plants that have been designed and built by AECL around the world for over 40 years. Even though the reactor is shut down, the fuel inside the reactor continues to produce heat and needs to be cooled. This heat is called decay heat and represents a small fraction of the heat produced during normal operation. To reduce this heat, natural circulation takes over when the pumps that normally push the coolant through the heat transport system lose power and stop working. For natural circulation to continue over time, the steam generators need to be filled with cool water. Standby power generators operate pumps that provide this cool water to the steam generators. A nuclear power plant needs one or two standby power generators. If, for some reason, standby power generators stop working, emergency power generators are then used. 
A nuclear power plant requires only one emergency power generator to provide enough electricity to power all of the important safety systems. But again, as a precaution, all nuclear power plants have at least two emergency power generators on site. At this point, to maintain natural circulation, pressure relief valves on the steam generator system open automatically to remove heat. The steam that is vented into the environment is clean and not radioactive. Water continues to be added in the steam generators by pumps powered by the emergency power generators. Together, the pressure relief valves and the added water maintain natural circulation to safely cool the reactor. Though unlikely, let's keep going and assume the emergency power generators stop working. We now have a total station blackout. This means all power sources used to cool the reactor and spent fuel pool, including off-site power, on-site power, and the standby and emergency power generators are all unavailable. Batteries are now powering emergency lighting and essential instrumentation. Water is now being added by a gravity-driven system connected to a reserve water storage tank. This keeps enough water in the steam generator to maintain natural circulation. This also allows time for emergency mitigation equipment to be put in place. Emergency mitigation equipment includes portable pumps, portable power generators and fire trucks. These can be used to add water directly into the plant's systems and ensure vital monitoring equipment is available. In a total station blackout, the large amount of water in the spent fuel pools would slowly heat up. Workers would manually add water as necessary to keep the spent fuel covered by water and cooled. It is important to remember that up to this point, there have been no releases of radiation into the environment and no damage to the reactor. With the situation under control, the reactor can return to normal operation after a number of safety checks are performed.